Ready? Yep. My name is Kent Stanton. I have lived in Pensacola since approximately 1977. I was told there'd be no math. <laughs> um, have you lived anywhere else? Briefly, I lived in Jacksonville, Florida, and was born in Bowie, Maryland. Mostly, I pretty much lived most of my formative years here in Pensacola. Um, are you, have you been in any uh, bands with, in Pensacola? Many. I might have to. I, I can never remember. What were some of the bigger ones? The main band I played in for years and years was that started off as a punk band was called The Unemployed. And we started off skate punk and eventually progressed to what they called alternative rock. And you do uh, solo music as well. Why don't you tell me a little bit about, you know, just the type of music you want to play, the style of music you play solo. That's an excellent question. I'm going to have to, uh, that's a tough one. That's fine. Take your time. I, um, I'm in no rush. Caprice, how would you? That's so hard for me to answer, but I will answer it. Okay. The, um, I mean, that's a good, it's a tough question to answer. Well, let's let's kind of narrow it down. So, the la what was um, what was one of the last songs you wrote, and like kind of what was the inspiration for that? So, narrow that down. I'll tell you, this is like a, the problem. My songwriting process. I don't even know how it works. That's why it's a tough question yeah. to answer. It's not very uh, well thought out. That's okay. Everything, my whole life, everything just comes out, and I form it one line at a time, one melody. It all comes together accidentally. <laughs> but right now, I it went from playing in bands on my whole life, playing in a lot of bands, and now it's just me and my me and my lonesome guitar, telling songs of woe and regret. So one thing I've noticed with some of the musicians is they're in punk bands in their youth, but as they get older, they'll you know they do what you just said. They you know it's them and an acoustic guitar, or you know maybe a duo with a drummer. What do you think that transition is from, you know, a more aggressive punk style to an acoustic set? Mm. I think the most practical answer would be, in practically, a lot of people, it's tougher to hold a whole band together as you get older, with more responsibilities, and it's, if you have the passion for what you did previously, usually the next step is to continue a lot of people I think learn how to play guitar to continue and it's a uh, fortunately it's a very um it's a very appreciated the singer songwriter is very for a long time it's been back in fashion mm -hmm. and so that works out well for us old punks who uh it Seems like the times just work out well. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> makes sense. And it's a, uh, and I hope the answer makes sense because I think it's just a natural transition. Because like if if you got into music because you love to express yourself the best way you can with other people, and it's easy to continue to do the same thing. I guess a lot of that also would depend on why a person was playing in the first place. There's all kinds of answers to that simple question. I bet you the, uh, yeah, I guess every solo performer is different. What, Doing um, it for different reasons. When you were in The Unemployed, did you play guitar? <clears throat> when we started off, The Unemployed started in the garage as an afternoon project of two people trying to learn. I played guitar, and Jeff Ron, who's now with Errol Skiller Squirrel, played drums, and we just beat out things, and then we added some words. And then a, a guy named Danny Holmes, who now lives in Panama City, he was actually a phenomenal guitar player. He started jamming with us, and it actually sounded good enough <laughs> to where we did a few parties where in the beginning I was just singing. We didn't even have a bass player. And we, so that was the early punk days. We didn't realize it was early, but just, hey, When was that? Uh, about 85, maybe, you know, it was more like, well, there's also some guys at this keg party who wanna, bring their instruments and like, yeah, live music. Da, da, da. And then I, for, that sort of 
became a punk band, and then eventually I picked up guitar and played rhythm, and then then when Danny left, I took over. Let me stop. Um, and I was thinking too, even Ricardo, I'm still thinking about. It's a great question. Why do people do what they do? And it's but like, I believe like with, if people are truly passionate, like, um, I love to play music because I love to share music, the in mutual what punk is or mm -hmm. art or anything the exchange of ideas and emotion and I guess some people either they don't they, they quit or they take the next step they maybe learn how to play it through the guitar and keep sharing that or whether story or Henry Rollins gone into spoken word Henry learn how to play guitar um what were some of your favorite local bands in Pensacola just through you coming growing up? Headless Marines. We started off with them. Loved the Headless Marines. The real early bands were kind of a blur. Mm -hmm. I liked a band called the Generic Americans. Mm -hmm. They didn't last real long. Um, and then when you get in, I mean, it's real hard because there's so, so many, which I know all of them will be a message by somebody at one point. And um, it was just, oh, there's so many. They came and go and like. Do so you remember what your first show was? Well, my personal first show was Harry Chapin. Where was that at? At the UWL Fieldhouse when I first moved here. And I ended up singing on stage as a backup singer. That's how, that and Elvis is how I began my Pensacola music career. Um, then a bunch of rock and roll shows, the rock and roll years, Van Halen. The, man, that's, I wish I could think of where, where actually like my first show, cause, and definitely like Maggot Sandwich, Descendants, when we slowly started going to punk shows. I don't remember what my actual first one was, but which would probably, but just, yeah, I don't remember my actual first one. Um, what were some of the, what were some of your favorite venues to go see the shows at in Pensacola? Honest to God, and I'm not even trying to be funny. As much as I've seen close and come and go in this town, any place that was open and having shows, straight up, because they're all, that's a blanket answer. Like if they were having live music and allowing original music, it was good enough. But there's, good Lord, VFW halls, Unico Hall. Has anybody mentioned that? Mm -hmm. Unico, that's where the, we had some descendants played there, SNFU. I always remember us being upset that we had the cover price went from $3 normally for local bands. It's like we got to pay five for the descendants. Ah, oh, Jesus. Unico, VFW, and then Victor Hugo's, which became Sluggo's. All the different Sluggo's, with Terry and I counted eight. Eight Sluggo's? Eight and four. More than I've heard so far. Yes, we, we meticulously counted, because it's, there was eight. Do you happen to remember where all of them were? Victor Hugo's. I always have this habit of pointing in the direction of the city I'm talking about. Over there. <laughs> Victor Hugo's, which became Sluggo's. And the exact order which they moved from these, at one point between Bedlam and Jefferson, where they moved across the street, they had a brief opening at the Barrels, which is now a car sales, or it's, a, it's, on, w, it's on Navy Boulevard by the golfy, Goofy Golf Place, the Quonson Huts. It's a, it was a car dealership, now it's an Army Navy surplus. But they had Open there, had a couple shows for about a winter. It was cold and miserable. Back downtown, Handlebar. Short-lived place called, it was called Luggo's, Sluggo's Lost City, right down the street on Garden. It used to be, one in the 50s, it was a restaurant, then became a thrift store. Terry owned that whole building. They had a grand, and it was open for a couple months. It was gonna be like a punk rock mall. It was huge. I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah, the, the, it, it was open and it was awesome. Against Me, we have, my, we played with Against Me there. And um, 
Dave Dondera and me, but the, uh, that didn't last long. Then um, Jefferson, I think that was eight. I might have missed something. That's it, it was sluggos. Is, we were all, always used to moving in the middle of the night on the run. <laughs> oh, and the, so the mix, so, and of course handlebar, um, the mix, the end of the line, definitely some of my favorite shows there. You need to check this. You need to check this. Oh, no, it's mine. Yeah. No, no, it's all right. There we go. Three, you know, half shows, they're always in. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that drew you into punk music? Um, skateboarding, for sure. Um, at the time, around 84, I was a Van Halen fanatic still until David Lee Roth and broke up I but I, I, I was I was hearing a lot of skate rock with my peers younger people mostly skateboarding pretty much because that's what was playing at the ramp and I um definitely like the oh, it blended right in before we without even knowing it or like I was hearing all this and then when I started when I was trying to learn how to play guitar, I was mostly trying to learn Van Halen, which was completely unsuccessful, and it was a lot easier to write bar chord songs about skateboarding, which was actually punk unbeknownst to me, I guess. The, the, um, it was definitely the skateboarding, because everybody was listening to it and got to liking it. And uh, what do you think about all the, the different subgenres of punk? I mean, you don't have to go through every one, but just like the idea that, do you think that they are, that they can all be together? Do you think like they're all, like to be, to listen to one, you can't listen to another? I mean, that's kind of a I, weird question, I know. But no, it's not a weird question at all. And I guess at, at my age, I done give up on all that <laughs> shit. A long time ago. I always remember when we started in the cafe where I started hearing like 13 different versions of core. I'm like, I can't keep up anymore, kids. I just can't do it. But, and I'm, I just have a real simple philosophy because when you get deconstructing what is what, who is who, it's more like, man, are you real or not? And that's something that can't be defined. People just know it. The audience knows it. So for whatever it is, it clicks. So when it comes to subgenres, I, I think it's more without sounding. I mean, we're it's marketing. We're purposely being led into subgenres so things can be categorized and sold easier. And I hope that. Mm -hmm. What What do you think are some of the misconceptions of punks, like either from the outside or just like the misconceptions of the music? Sort of what you were just touching on. But I think the biggest misconception is, from my point of view, is that it actually, that one thing is punk and one thing is not. And uh, it sort of reminded me of a, like a great example of subgenres. Like, if you got one band that's playing melodic, angsty, heartbreak, emo punk, you're like, is that punk? But then you also, then you got like bands like Flogging Mollies that are actually re play in an Irish tradition, is that punk? It was like, well, Irish, whatever the, it, what is punk? Punk is. What is it to you? It's, it's following your heart. It's really simple and basic. I can't quite describe it because once, like I think as you asked me the questions, like if you have to ask, it's not punk. Or punk is never having to say you're sorry. It's either the only, the only real punk thing is if you have to, just like with everything, if you have to convince somebody you're a punk, you're probably not punk. It's, it's, punks can be anything. Just as it's, you just go to your own drummer and that drummer and all those drummers somehow find each other. What do you think is unique about Pensacola scene? I think the most unique thing that helped birth it long before my time is I, you know, I can't even, their people were already doing punk and stuff. And, um, but it's like, I, I think the small town is what made, it's a beautiful town. 
it's a wonderful place, but it's also extreme. The clash of very creative, unhappy, smothered kids like in the 70s, 60s, you know, the, the way this town has a way of containing you, but you fight harder to break out of it and you find your own. Uh, we've always found something to do. I think the fact that this is such a small town created one of the more creative. We, we built our own ramps. We, I still can't, I still can't imagine how a bunch of dumb kids could structurally engineer a perfect half pipe and find all the stuff for free. But it forced us to get creative. And I think that's what Harvard, like Terry doing what she did and everything I've seen, it's like we, we, we produced our own skate content. It was, we had to make some fun. And then that grew into, now that, now that the music seems a little more official. Back then it wasn't that official. What What was some of your favorite parts of it? Like, what was some of your favorite, you know, where, where did some of your favorite memories come from? I, th I guess like the early, and as I slowly discovered like what eventually came, like the DIY ethic and the camaraderie, but it, say like you, you'd all meet at a ramp and everybody generally get along because we were like-minded. We knew that the the jocks or whatever, everybody else was against us, so we had to get along. But the sense of community that's never ever left, but the bigger it got, there's more division. But back in starting off, there was only like, at best, like say four punk bands. So they always played the same shows. There was never shows, so it was always an event, no matter what, everybody went. And usually at the end of the night, all four bands would end up making songs up together. And um, and it's the same spirit that still lives in the community. It's just that it's such a bigger, with all the subgenres and the whatever you want to call them. But the scene gets bigger and bigger and more bands. But that initial specialness about Pensacola, it's never left. Like there's, there's always another generation doing the exact same thing. And I, and I guess it's the same for all these other, like the cities you'll be dealing with. I, it introduced me to real sense of community, like real family that still, we're still tight. Were there or are there any downsides to the scene? Of course. Drama. Drama and hearsay. And yeah, I've seen, I've seen uh, rumors. It's, it's always, it's always very important to find out who the source is because, and that's not, I don't think that, that is definitely not unique to Pensacola. Yeah, that's something, I mean, that, that alone is pretty much just the entire premise of history. It's like, what are your sources of all of this? Like, like don't just believe well, it because someone tells you. One of my favorite examples, because there's been some, I like, hear stories of people, are, they believe it, it's fact, and they'll just, for years, we used to, unemployed used to do a lot of TSOL. We did a lot of TSOL covers, which was fact, we were well known for that. At one point, I remember a guy coming up to me, he's like, man, that was awesome last year when y'all played with TSOL, which we did later. We had never ever played with TSOL. But this guy, he saw it, he was there. He was telling me how awesome it was the funniest thing, evidently. And I heard this from quite a few people who saw us steal their set list and play it before they had a chance to, and they were pissed. And I was like, it's a great story, but it never happened. Maybe he was a time traveler. But I mean, you know, <laughs> like, I. I know I didn't forget that, but the fact I've seen that with a lot of things, people just jump on the best story yeah. rather than the true story. Yeah. But we got to stick together. Where do you think Pensacola's punk scene fits in Pensacola's history? Um, I think, well, whatever it is in Pensacola's history, there's obviously a special town being one of the, the, the debatable. I think they finally decided we are the oldest. We just know that. It's not the most continuous oldest, but it is the oldest. Set. It, there's something about the general history of Pensacola and the fact that punk is hard enough. They've shut down a lot of places, but they've never seceded. They, they tried to squash the punk scene, but they haven't done it yet. And I guess that's the same in a lot of cities, but they, uh, 
And that's the kind of question, like when you ask people from out of town, if you, I mean, I could go on, it's because the scene's awesome. Because we look out for our own. Because we do stuff. And again, you, I hope I'm helping you out. I'm just rambling. But I, little stuff, like what I was talking about, there's never anything to do, so we had to do stuff. I love one night, go over to the cafe, and they're like, we're having a soapbox derby on 14th Avenue next week. Everybody, doesn't matter what you roll down on, what you wear, just try to look good and finish. And we actually did it, and, and Scotty won on an office chair, and it was a blast. But themed moments like that, we're like, we're just, we got to stir some shit up. Do you know when that was? Oh, that was around the cafe days, around 2002. Um, which cafe? Uh, Van Gogh's has um, it segued into end of the line. Do you, has anybody told you much? Of, you probably have other people can tell you that transition even. Uh, not yet. I do. I am interviewing Jen Knight next week though, so Is probably it, at least get some of that from her. I mean, just the whole general idea. Like Scotty, Jen came in at the moment. Just the fact that we were all punks working at this cafe shop because they'd hire us and. Mm -hmm. They kind of gave it to us before we knew it. We started doing shows. They're like, why don't y'all just take it over? That's when Jen came in. But the fact that Scotty and I were joking about this is like, you can't, we didn't mean to, but somehow we just won the battle and they handed over the cafe, turned into the end of the line before we knew it. We had, we're like, that's why Def Leppard's like, they just gave it to you? We're like, pretty much. Um, why do you think, do you think it's important to record Pensacola's punk history? Yes. How okay. come? Because it's because it's awesome. Sorry, I got it. Yeah, you're fine. Um, what? The um. Well, you can just wait until you sit down. That way, we get all of it. That's why I hope I can be a, when you end it, that I can, my disjointedness can help add to the <laughs> overall picture. I think it's important to record it because it's, 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 it's amazing, it's magical, it's a, again, like any, any other city, but the things we accomplished and we're still accomplishing, no one's ever been able to, like, like ask Scott when you talk to him he'll tell you the same thing I don't know quite what it is but there's something about this town that is no one can ever put their finger on it but we know it like it's uh it's special and we definitely like I think I think the contributions of, of Pensacola definitely deserve to be on the with other great clubs that, that most people have never heard of um, what is, what is some of the direction, some of the inspiration you have for the art you do? Um, I don't know. It just happens. <laughs> just happens. I even hate how when you watch the interviews, people are like on TV, that's an excellent question. That's a good question, but I, I, I was gonna say, like, I'm trying to like think of questions like maybe something like no one, maybe no one's ever asked, or you you don't actually think about when you're doing it, but once someone asks, you know, it, it starts working those. Yeah, it's everything that I do is so spontaneous at the time. That's why when I start thinking about it, it's a good question because I should I should know more what a. I'm Take your time. trying to think of a simple way to answer that because I don't think about it, but I definitely. Every answer that's popping in my head doesn't make any sense as far as it sounds too broad. We'll try I like it. just like yeah, say I want to see what happens. I like um I love it, yes, a specific question and it all every answer sounds too grand. Like don't bullshit us. Because like, I don't think about what I do, it just comes out so in hindsight. But I and you said art. Just yeah. like, I mean, you can, it can be your music too, but... I'm I know that... I haven't figured out the answer to this one, but I generally... I, 
any art that I do, whether it's music, photography, or visual graphics, I, I guess I'm in a quest to, um, without knowing I'm doing it, but to record somehow the things that I'm so excited about, just life in general, everything, there's like the American beauty, there's beauty all around, there's so much beauty, I can hardly contain myself. Um, do you think that there was a golden age for Pensacola's punk scene? There's been a, there's been four of them that I've seen, and I'm sure I know there's many more to come. And there's definitely what would be perceived as a golden age. There's been a few. There's been enough to, like that's that's a. You get a bunch of different concrete answers to that. And I'm just glad that I was able to see. Be around, be able to be around for them. Like for like one person might say the golden age was seeing the Descendants and SNFU and. Seven seconds at Seville. That was the golden age. It's like no, but five years later, we're watching Pennywise, all these Green Day, all these other bands we never heard of. So it's it's a it's a it's a continuing process. So it hasn't ended. No, not even close. It it, it hides, pulls the covers over its head. It takes a nap. Leaves town also and goes to better places, but it always it's it hasn't ended, and I don't think it will. Um, Pensacola gets you know I, I've heard it, a number of people have heard it. They, it has a reputation as being a black hole. You know, so if someone moves away, they're bound to come back eventually. Do you think that that's a negative thing, or just that Pensacola is so unique that they want to come back? I think. Here's someone, I'm teasing right now, she's in the midst of this conundrum herself, having moved from beautiful Memphis, Tennessee, having been a resident of our lovely city for four years, yet still a world traveler. Because the, um, I think, I, I've noticed that, watched that trend and I love it, it's definitely a fact. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say it's black holes too, too dire. What? what? I'm gonna look at that black hole term in a different thing, it's like, yeah, we're a massive black hole because the gravity of people's commitment and essence to this town, it cannot escape. They don't know why they come back. <laughs> the, um, I think a lot of people need, to, I've always said, I told younger folks, like if I hadn't been able to do brief traveling with a band, whether it was a weekend, if I hadn't been able to get out of this town, I'd hate it, which is normal I think for anybody. But I think a lot of people, it's a great town, a lot of people that travel more always heard, and I agree, it's a, it's a wonderful place to come home to. And I think most people leave for a while, like they should and they need to, and see the world. And and then they have a better, per, just, we have, I've always said, we have a really, really well for such a small town. Like, we could always drive to New Orleans if we wanted to see somebody who wouldn't come here, or Atlanta. It's a great place where you can escape to the big city real easy. Do you think, that Pensacola's location aided and why so many of those bands came through here? Aided Pens the location? Yeah, like like you said, so you know, New Orleans is one direction, Atlanta's another. Do you think because of where we are situated and, and around all in the middle of all these bigger cities, do you think that's part of the reason why some of those national bands stopped through here so, for so often? Yes. At, well, back then, however the touring circuit worked out, and I know a lot of it had to do, well, this is vagueness, but in general, the fact that Sluggo's had such a reputation, and basically our people, everybody liked it here. They liked stopping here, so they came back, they came back, and Sluggo's, when it was two-story, could support. And um, I think it had a lot to do with, I think, through Terry and Nick, knowing so many bands who weren't famous yet were being treated so well by our lovely town and our wonderful people. They liked coming, so they came and networked, and that's why more bands, and that was a consistent flow. Everybody liked coming here until the closed and then all those dry spells, which we never fully were able to recover, but it's, it's all good. But at that little period, 
all these bands that they played here one time, they remembered it, they made sure they came back. Um, did you ever live in any of Pensacola's like punk houses, like 309, the Rat House or anything? I lived in 309. For how long and when? Um, from about 2000 to about 2003. I started off living in a very, very much to the rules and requirements of punk rock living. I started off living in a camper out front, waited my turn. It's true. <laughs> Moved to a bungalow in the closet, eventually upgraded to a bedroom, retired with a master porch, just as it should be. But that, I lived there for three years. And there was a place I lived next to, I think it was called the Core House, which got destroyed. I didn't live there very long before I moved into 309. Mostly 309 would be the best straight up punk house. And it was, I loved it. What were some of your experiences there? So many that it's all a blur because there was always something great happening. But my, I think my favorite thing was being able to, um, and it's funny how, there's so many people, it's hard to remember the band names, but I always loved, a band might come in town for a week and stay at the house and hang out at the cafe. So basically had new best friends for a week, and the next week you had a whole nother set of new, and that, I mean, it was by far the best, the, the community, potlucks, we didn't do a lot of shows when I lived there because we did all the shows at the cafe. Mm -hmm. But it was great. You'd wake up, walk right across the street, make yourself some coffee, wait for the band to show up. Never knew who was going to drop in. Um, how do you feel about the project that's going on to preserve it um, that Scott Satterwhite's working on? I am so happy. Especially in the hands of such an accomplished uh, fighter. Like, I... I'm really, really excited. I don't even, I'm speechless because it's like I know they I know how serious it is. It's not just talk. I mean, as far as historic register, there's that house. It, I thought for sure it would, it would get torn down, but uh, I, I'm I'm very, very excited. This punks we just can't. They're not going to run us out of that neighborhood. What do you think are some of the, what do you think the reason is that Pensacola scene creates such strong ties? Or and do you think it's unique to Pensacola or just like punk scenes in general? I haven't traveled enough to, I, well, I, I, traveling enough, I think, I think it's a punk scene in general, DIY. Everybody already knows exactly why they're doing what they're doing and what they're up against and that alone creates a bond. And most people work really well in the, within the constraints of that, that unspoken by. Everybody knows it's a, you're fighting you know, from beginning of punk or way before punk or whatever, like the, the, the rebels, the artists and the creatives already know in the larger scheme of thing, they're fighting an uphill battle. So we got to stick together. And I think that creates a bond that just leads to natural community. Do you think that, I, th I think, did I ask earlier about misconceptions of punk? I think so, right? You mentioned it. Um, so one of those is typically violence uh, go hand in hand with punks. Do you think there's anything to that? Um, now, as far as the, uh, as far as the stereo is not a real word, stereotypicalization. As far as the... Uh, the stereotype. What's a better word? Or stereotype. Or the the ideas that come to mind. To me, no. Like, the, when I think punk, the last thing I think of is violence. Because... See, now I'm wandering in all these existential thoughts. But yeah, like, of course there's violence in punk, like there's violence in football. But no... To me, and the things I love about my community is never, violence has never been a part of it. It's always been standing up against violence. And um, 
you know, even watching the evolution of the early, we used to call them vicious circles or slam dancing. And then before I know it, what's this? Why are these people beating each other up and what is mosh? But no, it's, it's never been violent. That's always been the beautiful thing about it. At its core, it's not violent at all. But yeah, so that non-answer. Of course, violence is associated, but violence, there's nothing punk about violence. Do, do you consider yourself a punk? Um, depends on who's asking. I, yeah, definitely, de definitely depends on who's asking. But between you and I, yeah, I do. Um, why don't we, why don't we go over the, the Def Leppard story for a little bit? All right. Kind of take a then, quick breather. Yeah. I, I love the questions and it's, I don't if I've never had to think too much about what's happened. And if all Same of a sudden our, something pops in your head, just, just let me know. I mean. I want as was much excited information as possible. Like, wait, I think I got the interviewer speech, so he looks like me. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I'm kind of hoping that what you end up with when you're done, mm -hmm. with all these stories edited, however you see fit, that it somehow captures what W seems to be able to really. Well, that's what that's part of the goal. It, it is the reason I ask some of these open ended generic questions is because everyone's going to have a different response to it. And what I want to show is that it's it's a lot more complicated than anyone thinks. And it's, you know, for anyone on the outside, there is, you know, the, that I that the stereotype of a punk where it's always a mohawk or something. But that that doesn't that that doesn't make someone a punk. That's just a style choice. And like that there is a whole lot of different nuance to it that just like any other scene that you don't recognize if you're not part of. Well, and it's like I have no even point going into it, but really the larger thing of seeing it where anything, no matter what it is, once they get a hold of it, they can sell it. It's okay. It's the nature of the business of the world, but it's not really punk anymore. And maybe either way, punk is so, to me, I think it's so, it's such a personal we all have to ask ourselves, are we punk? I've dealt with it since I've discovered it. Because <laughs> I grew up, when I was in high school, it was long hair, band shirt, baggy jeans, but I had all my, all my friends were the, you know, leather vest studs, you know, the, or the denim vest and the leather jackets. They had the mohawks and the dyed hair. And I was like, I, I was, I was the outsider of them, but yet I was still part of that entire group. And and that's, I love, like, because there's, man, there's people of all walks of life that are totally punk. Grandmas, surfers, farmers. It's just, I, yeah, it's like, a, that's such a good question. Like, what is punk? But I think, you know, really, like, the essence of punk is, like, something you want to do and you don't think you can do, find a way to do it. Whether it's music or... So, why don't you tell me about Def Leppard? and them showing up to end of the line. All right, yeah, and you'll definitely have to help me shorten this story about that. Right. I, no, I, I want, like I said, I want the long version. <laughs> Look at you laughing over there in the corner. Help me, Caprice, help me. And I've already, like, again, the climate at the time, I gave you the backstory. It was pretty rough, the cafe, we did every day. Why was it rough? Well, just this, when the people started wanting to buy property in that neighborhood, which was, un I didn't quite know that at the time, they discovered we want to clean out the elements. So the city was officially, people were trying to shut us down. City council meetings. That place stinks. It's a bunch of nasty old dirty punks. All that going on. But one, I knew Def Leppard was going to be in town. That's all I knew and saw their buses. I jokingly wrote on our chalkboard, at this time there was not much business, it was mostly trained kids. It was more of a, it was more like a recreational center for wayward youth than a, a business of any sorts. Um, I put on the sign, Def Leppard Eats for free, as a joke, ha ha, yeah, sure, they're gonna show up here. Slow day, sometime in the early afternoon, a gentleman walks in and I immediately recognized him as not being from this town and his accent. I was like, 
I knew that it was a guy from Def Leppard. And now I'm just thinking about it myself. But I, I never addressed the fact that I knew who he was. But I was more like, hey, welcome to Pensacola. Are you enjoying yourself? He had a latte. So he started asking me about the cafe. I told him that we we're just a bunch of punks who inherited it. And when he found out about the train kids, what? Kids ride trains all over the country and stop here? He just thought that was awesome. And uh, I just told him, he asked more about what we did there. I said, we're just a bunch of punks trying to keep the scene going. We have shows. And we talked for quite a few hours. Then he left. And I had a feeling he'd come back the next day, which he did. We talked some more. And uh, just loved to hear about the train kids. And um. At one point I'd say, hey, we got to open mic tonight if nonchalantly. If you're just not doing anything, you want to come to the open mic? Um, he's like, yeah, we might do that. And then before they left, I was like, Phil, I hate to ask you this, but I'm broke. I'd love to see your show tonight. And he's like, mate, why don't you ask, motherfucker? Set me up with tickets to the show. We went and saw the show went with Paul Williams from Subterranean Books, which at the time... Phil Collin asked, he's like, what's there to do in this town? There wasn't nothing. I, the best I could give him was, you should go to Subterranean Books. But that's how we got to know each other. He, he's a, back to the story. We're at the show. We went backstage, which was nothing but the bathrooms meet and greet. It's real depressing. But Phil Collin said, ah, you're here. He came over and he went and got the drummer, Rick Allen. Ha, ha, ha. He said, this is the bloke I was telling you about. He's got the cafe. You still having the open mic? And I was like, oh, we're closed, but I got the keys. You want to jam? Sarcastically, yeah, we'll meet you there in 40. I'm like, oh, shit. So we left, went over there, and Davey Blackman, Andy, I remember them being there, outside, locked up. I was like, oh, shit, I think Def Leppard's coming over. And uh, as we were talking, they came walking over with their guitar and hand drum, the two of them. He said, yeah, the bus is... We got 45 minutes. The buses are going to come and pick us up. Let's jam. So we started playing my songs. At that point, there was three punk houses in the neighborhood. No internet. Cell phones. Word got out real quick. This place started filling up. It got real crowded. All the buses showed up. We ended up playing for about three hours. And they just had a blast. And they were kept talking about they're like, man, we're sick of titty bars. We're just old hippies. This is more our speed. We love it. They made the buses stop and made everybody get off. Said, oh, we can wait to get to Tampa. We're having too much fun. And I uh, just had a really, really great night. It was all punks and Def Leppard playing Ken Stanton songs. I tricked them into playing Jump with me. They didn't even know it. And, um... It was just awesome. And I think they stayed till about two in the morning. They eventually finally had to go. And I'll never forget, we're all outside saying our goodbyes, taking pictures, and they're getting on the tour bus. And the last thing Rick Allen said to me, he was there like, bye, he's getting on the bus. But he said, next time you see us, we'll be jumping off a fucking train, mates. <laughs> and then they left. That's great. And uh, the, uh, just for the, like, in case you can edit this in, is like, like I said, they were absolutely enamored with what all these broke-ass punks were accomplishing in this southern town. They could not believe it. It's like, there's a scene here. If you had to preserve one message of your time in Pensacola, of the scene, to last eons, what do you think that message would be? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, which was always in my head, it sounds trite, and a cliche, but don't, don't let the bastards get you down. Your will is always stronger than the, the paperwork. Straight up, like, stick together. Yeah, now I'm thinking of all kinds of messages. It's like, tell them. Yeah, well, just. I feel like I'm interviewing with humans in New York right now at this moment. It's like, 
start the music, Capri, some background music. I'm about to say some deep shit. <laughs> really just the, 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 what was one message that I'd like to leave is that Yeah, it was like, don't let the bastards, I'm quoting songs. I think there's a song called Don't Let the Bastards Get You Down. By the Toasters. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to quote the band Cinderella on their one fabulous hit. You don't know what you got till it's gone. Enjoy the moment. It's always happening right around you. Don't look back and see how awesome it was 10 years ago because it's awesome right now, today can't stress that enough don't wait five years and you're like you know that was I remember that time so oh, that was actually pretty awesome but now they're all famous and they won't come see us again but and that's what punk is taking advantage of the moment yeah it's really hard from when you ask me to be philosophical it's impossible I feel silly but yeah, just there's there were no good old days. They're they're right here. You just won't know for a while. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I'm sure I'll, I'll I'll be I'll just send you text messages all day of all the things I forgot to say. And uh, you would be the first. <laughs> no, hopefully I covered little. Again, I think ever you got enough contributions to. I hope I've expressed how much. But yeah, this town is. It's amazing. Don't. Well, I've always heard my whole life how much the town sucks. There's nothing going on. And I'm just like, I know, but you wait five years, you'll be like, God, you, that place was awesome. All right, if you can just do, uh, just I'm Ken Stanton, just give me a, give me a good outro. Outro? Yeah. That being an ex exit. Outro. I'm, I'm, no, well, more like an intro. Just like, just like an intro. Just your name again. Put on your acting face. <laughs> no, I love it. And it's like I've always been notorious where I can do things spontaneous and be like, "Do that again." I'm like, <laughs> "My name's Ken Stanton. I'm a Pensacola resident, long time musician, artist." Perfect.